In order to make a great waterfall image, it starts with a great HDR image. By shooting with multiple brackets, it's easy to choose the best. I could really do a slow shutter and get great looking water, and then merge that with another exposure for the sky, and perhaps some other detail inside of the trees. The HDR that I'm about to create is not an over-the-top, obnoxious HDR. I'm going to do it with HDR Soft Photomatics, which is a cross-platform tool. You could download the free 30-day demo and give it a shot and see what you think. And you can even do this with the Essentials version of the app. But if you don't want to try this, you will find HDR available in other products out there, and you can use that too. But let me walk you through how I made my image. You'll see here that I worked out my base exposure, and that worked out well for getting sort of the middle of the image, but it completely lost the sky. When I expose for the sky, all the details in the trees is essentially lost. But by shooting this with different brackets on my camera, I was able to capture that entire scene. Now, there's going to be an added benefit here. You see the water going through? I did some long exposures, so it got nice and silky. And when I combine all of these different exposures together, I'm going to get that perfect waterfall shot. What's going to happen is the sky will be properly exposed, the water is going to look nice and silky, and the surrounding image is going to be perfectly exposed. So let's do this using HDR. Let me switch on over to Photomatics from HDR Soft. This is the Photomatics Pro version, and the first step is to load my bracketed photos. I'll just click the button here and browse to their location. Now, I've put these all in one directory to make it easier to find, but there's several ways to do this. You could just manually browse to their location and find the files and select individual files, or use one of your favorite photo organization tools like Lightroom or Bridge, and then invoke this with a plugin. Let me just go to these images directly, though, and click Load. You'll see it puts it into the application. You do have the choice to see the intermediary 32-bit image. This is an advanced option. This will allow you to view the 32-bit merge or even take it into another application if you wanted to hand the HDR file off. But for now, I'm just going to leave that unchecked, and I'll do my conversion and process here. Click OK, and you'll see that it brings up the pre-processing options. The good news is, is that they're pretty straightforward. Let's take advantage of aligning the source images to remove any ghosting or any unwanted echoes. I did use a remote, so my hands weren't on the camera. This really cut down on any sort of vibration. That remote shutter release was quite helpful. Let's tell it to align those, and we'll tell it to match the major features. And it can also adjust for any perspective issues, although we shouldn't have these since the shot was not handheld. It's a good idea to worry a bit about ghosting with the longer exposures because the clouds are going to move a lot and you might see some subtle movement in the trees from the wind. Let's choose the selective deghosting option and we can use that up on the clouds. I also find it's a good idea to reduce noise overall because all of the noise in the individual brackets will combine to create a noisier image in total. Now, you could do this on just the underexposed images which are more prone to noise or choose to invoke it for all images. I tend to favor all images. That's also in part because I shot this on Micro Four Thirds, which tends to be a little bit noisier than shooting on a DSLR. It's also a good idea to choose the Reduce Chromatic Aberration option, since we have some very high contrast areas in the scene. Chromatic aberration will be seen as color fringing around some of the edges. Let's just stick with the white balance that the camera shot, and everything looks pretty good. Click Pre-Process to start the merge. Now what it's doing here is it's going through the files, analyzing them, doing any necessary pre-processing, and it will create a merged file. You can see that it's ticking through all of the images and the individual steps. Now this process is pretty straightforward, and it allows Photomatix Pro to go through the images, analyze them, and compensate for any issues that it encounters. It'll then apply some cleanup algorithms to remove noise and any potential issues from ghosting, or other problems like chromatic aberration. Now it's in the alignment process. Now I mentioned earlier that this wasn't a necessary step since I shot from a tripod, but it's not a bad idea to try it and allow the tool to make minor adjustments just in case there was subtle movement to the camera. One of the things I like about Photomatix Pro though is even with handheld HDR, it's often able to successfully merge the files together. It's quite forgiving. There we go. Now we're in the dialog area for selective deghosting. Let's take a look at the top area of the photo, and you'll see that this is where the ghosting is more of an issue. 
Let's just drag to define the area to clean up. There we go. There's likely a little bit of movement in there. And that defines it pretty well. And mark that as being ghosted. Click the preview button to see it redraw. And that seems to work nicely. Now, let's actually let the images become a bit ghosted in the waterfall area because this will amplify the long exposure effect, which makes the water look silky. Let's click OK. Now it continues to analyze the ghosted areas and we'll clean them up. There we go, that's looking pretty good. I like how the sky is nice and clean. Now let's make our way through some of the available options. Photomatix Pro offers several different methods for the tone mapping process. This is the conversion from a 32-bit to a 16-bit image that really takes that wide dynamic range and turns it into a standard photo. You could do methods like details or tone compression, or a popular method like exposure fusion, which lets you merge multiple images together to combine the best part of each exposure. You'll also find several easy-to-use presets that you can step through to try out the different options. Some of them are quite dramatic and might be a bit too much for the image, and others are quite subtle. But remember, these are just starting points. You're free to manipulate the individual sliders to refine the look of the finished image. Now, personally, I prefer some of these enhanced ones here, which are much more subtle with the image. Let's take this and play with some of the available options. Click to show the more options so you can manipulate the sliders you see that you have the ability to refine the gamma. This allows me to lift the image up a little bit, as well as smooth out the highlights. That's looking pretty good. Let's also adjust the black point to put some more darkness into the shadowy regions. You can also access the advanced controls for additional smoothing options to smooth out the blending between highlights and shadows. This is useful because you can use these controls to refine these regions to avoid any glows or halos in the shadows or highlight regions. These are telltale signs of bad HDR. Now, I like how that's looking. This is working for me because it looks pretty natural. We've got great exposure in the sky, great exposure throughout the rest of the image, and the waterfall itself looks smooth and fantastic. Now that I'm satisfied, I can click Process to generate the final image. Now it's processing the image at high quality. Once it's done, you're offered a few additional finishing touches to refine the image. For example, you can introduce more contrast into different regions or apply a curves adjustment. I'm going to put just a little bit more into the shadowy region, just a small amount. And let's also lift the highlights a bit. All right, that looks really good. Switch over to the next tab, the color category. And this allows us to apply selective saturation to the different colors. For example, I could boost the intensity of the blue sky. And I can also take separate control over the greens. This makes it really easy to get in there and refine the image so that certain parts aren't too saturated and others can really pop. I'm going to leave the shadows alone, but I do like putting a slight boost here for this type of landscape image into the blues and the greens. That's really coming out nicely. Let's pull the reds down a little bit. This will make the brick and the mud more subtle in the image, so they're not so heavy present. And the last tab allows you to apply sharpening to bring out some of the details in the image. This can be really useful if you intend to print the image. Of course, you can also open the finished image up in Photoshop and take advantage of tools there. Let's apply a mild sharpening. That looks good, and I'll click Done. And now it processes the new final image. Now at this point, it's a good idea to save your work. Simply choose File, Save As, and I recommend you choose to save this as a 16-bit TIFF image. This will give you the maximum quality in the tagged image file format. And you'll notice here that I can even tell it to open the image up into Photoshop CC. So there it is, I've got the new image. Let's give it a descriptive name. There we go. Click Save and it's now going to process that image, save it to my hard drive, and then reopen it inside of Photoshop CC where I could take advantage of any other finishing touches that I'd like to add. All right, the finished image looks great and it's ready to share.